Ottawa is not a very military place, and Canada's not usually seen as a particularly warlike country. But it is a sovereign state, a member of the international system of sovereign states, so it fights wars. At various times, Canadian troops have killed Russians, Americans, Germans, Turks, Italians, Koreans, South Africans, and Japanese. And all those people got to kill Canadians, too. A hundred thousand of them in this century. This is a film about why people feel the need to keep armies and fight wars. We've made it in Israel because that's a country where the reasons why people fight wars and the costs of behaving that way are especially clear. Israel's only been an independent state for a short time and the direct connection between statehood and the ability to fight wars is still visible there. But Israel is basically no different from Canada or Russia or Argentina or anywhere else. It's just a very good example of how we're all trying to get what we want, or at least make ourselves safe, through military power, and how none of us are succeeding. It's June 2nd, 1982, the end of a normal day in northern Israel. But for Nimrod Hulovitz and his partner, the workday is just beginning. They'll spend the next 10 hours patrolling the boundaries of their kibbutz. They're searching for marauding thieves and the occasional wild boar that ravages their crops. They're also looking for Palestinian guerrillas. For Kibbutz Kfar Giladi sits on Israel's northern border, the border between Israel and Lebanon, the border between the Jews and their deadliest enemy, the Palestinians. If you want to know why it's been a good idea all through history to have a strong state with a good army, ask the Jews. They found out the hard way by losing theirs. This mountain's called Masada, and it was here about 1,900 years ago that the Roman army destroyed the last vestiges of Jewish independence. About a thousand men, women, and children who were the last survivors of the great Jewish revolt against Roman rule were holding out in a wooden fortress on top of Masada, so 15,000 Roman soldiers built a great earthen ramp up the side of the mountain to get at them. When the Romans finally reached the top and set the fortress on fire, the Jewish defenders chose to die rather than surrender. Men were chosen by lot to kill all the others and then commit suicide themselves. Only seven women and children who hid themselves in a water cistern were found alive by the Romans. And from that moment, there was no place in the world ruled by Jews for almost 19 centuries. By the early 20th century, there was a steady trickle of Jewish immigrants back to Palestine. But it was Hitler who provided the decisive push for the foundation of Israel. He proved, for anyone who doubted it, that in a world which runs on power, not on love, to be powerless is to be exposed to the most dreadful peril. It was the Jews of Europe who learned that lesson most bitterly of all. The language is a number of words for the Jewish experience as an exiled people without a state of their own. Ghetto, pogrom, holocaust. So when the Zionists decided it was time to put an end to this ordeal, they knew what they had to do. They had to recreate a strong, independent Jewish state. And to get or keep a state the way this world has always worked, you need an army. You have to be able to fight wars. Australia? Yes. Belgium? Yes. On May the 1st, 1948, the United Nations voted for the partition of Palestine between Jews and Arabs, for the creation of the State of Israel. Or rather, the UN gave the Jews the legal right to create Israel. But the Arabs claimed the same land, and within hours, the infant State of Israel was at war. Israel had to establish its right to exist the same way as most other countries, by war. A war which ended with more than half of former Palestine under the control of the state of Israel and much of its Arab population refugees. 
Getting the organized power of a state behind you may save you from being a victim, but it's very often at the cost of turning other people into victims instead. State uh, in the world in which we live means that you are recognized by the world, you have got a legitimate rights to do within your own country whatever you want. No need to get permission to bring in all the Jewish refugees from all over the world. To have the means to achieve the vision of the Zionist movement in much better way than without having the status of independent country and people. What you win by war, you must defend by further war. Now, in June 1982, there is no war, but Nimrod Horvitz, like all the men of his kibbutz, must take his turn patrolling its defenses. Look, I born in 1948, and I, uh, after, uh, when I was uh, half years old, they took, took us, all the kids, to Haifa, because it's a big war around. And now, uh, we live here and we don't take the, the children out. We have everything, we have the shelters and we have uh, security uh, around in the kibbutz. And you, you see by yourself how we, how we live here. It's wonderful here. Anyway, we like it. In we fact, like the Israelis live much the same way everybody else does. In temporary peace, armed to the teeth against potential enemies and under the permanent threat of war. Israel's wars come more often, but we all live in fortresses that we call states, and we all keep ourselves ready to fight the other states that fill the dangerous world beyond our borders. Kfar Giladi is in a particularly exposed part of Israel where the border makes a great curve. It's almost surrounded by enemies. On the north, by the Palestine Liberation Organization, the PLO, whose guerrillas occupy southern Lebanon, and across the valley to the east by the Syrians who wait in tanks beyond the Golan Heights. Yet, despite its precarious position, Kfar Giladi is a very peaceful place this cloudless morning early in June. The 400 members of the kibbutz have bought that peace with their lives. Forty of Kfar Giladi's members have died in Israel's six wars. And now, with the PLO sitting just across the border, they're paying for their security with constant watchfulness. The kibbutz is surrounded by ten guard towers and five miles of barbed wire. Ori Eshkoli is the manager of Kfar Giladi. Ori is now 39. On his 18th birthday, like all young Israelis, he went into the army. His first war came in 1967, the Six-Day War. Ori's unit was the first to fight its way inside the walls of the old city of Jerusalem, which had remained under Arab control since 1948. It was the fiercest fighting of the whole war. More than half of Israel's losses came in this single battle, but Uri survived untouched, and the city was taken. The Wailing Wall, the holiest place of the Jews, was once again in Jewish hands. Not only the city of Jerusalem was reunited by the Six-Day War, all of former Palestine, which had been divided between Arabs and Jews by the United Nations in 1948, was now under Israeli control. Israel's borders expanded enormously, and the hostile Arab armies around it were pushed back much farther away from heavily populated areas. But for the Palestinian Arabs, the Six-Day War was a disaster. Many of them, like the thousands who lived in this refugee camp near Jericho, 
had to flee the country altogether when Israeli troops seized the West Bank. The fate of the Jews in exile becomes the fate of the Palestinians. And for over a million Palestinian Arabs who stay behind in the occupied territories, all the future holds is permanent Israeli military rule. Most Palestinian Arabs have learned the same lesson from this miserable experience that the Jewish Zionists learned from their own people's long misery in exile. That without your own state and your own army, there can be no security, no possibility of controlling your own destiny. So a lot of recent Middle Eastern history has been taken up by the desperate attempts of the Palestinians to create their own state and army. It's in the nature of the system to force everybody to play the same game by the same ruthless rules. Not that even the Israelis, who are very good at the game, can win more than a temporary security from their military power. The destruction of three hijacked airliners on a disused airfield in Jordan in 1970 was one of the first signs that Palestinians themselves were starting to fight back. But the PLO was still too weak to strike at Israel. It concentrated mostly on easy targets outside Israel's borders, aiming for propaganda gains. The Palestinian guerrillas were still not the main threat to Israel's security. The real danger for Israel remained the regular armies of its Arab neighbors. Ovi Eshkoli's second war came two years after his first. It was called the War of Attrition. Ovi's unit was pinned down by a heavy Egyptian artillery bombardment one day in 1969. A tiny piece of Egyptian shrapnel found its way into his spine. It took six hours to get him out to a hospital, and Ori will never walk again. The human being is so flexible, so uh, I sometimes I forget it. I I'm a, a war disabled, and I live my life quite uh, normally. When I start to think over and all those things, it may hurt a little bit, but usual life go on. I go to work, I go to, to parties, I, go, I even dance sometimes. Uh, standing on a wall and lying on, a, on, a, on one of the girls that dance with me. Life goes on. But the life that goes on is haunted always by the possibility of violence. For the settlements like Far Giladi up on the northern frontier, life became far more dangerous in the 70s as PLO guerrillas began to bombard them with Katusha rockets from southern Lebanon and make raids across the border. The settlements had to turn themselves into fortified camps. We are suffering from the problem of security and, and Far Giladi was an open kibbutz like in all the villages all over the world. Today now is a kind of a fortress. There is a the fence all around the kibbutz. If the children want to go outside, they have to take with them a, a, one of the members with a gun. Some member who live here that must make guards. And of course, the Katusha attack. Uh, for example, the last year, in, in three uh, time, Fagadi was uh, hurt was hurt by a Katusha racket. At Kfar Giladi, the defenses are obvious, watchtowers and barbed wire. In most of the world, the boundary defenses are less visible, but we all live behind borders. For many of us, the border we defend is far away, and the main threat is from nuclear missiles, not guerrillas on foot. But the price of sovereignty is almost always blood in the end, the blood of other people's children and of your own. A small part of that price was paid on May 3rd, 1974, by another kibbutz just up the hill from Kfar Giladi. That night,
night, three PLO gunmen broke into Ms. Gavam's nursery and held its children hostage until morning. One child was killed and four were wounded. When Israelis do this to other people's children, they use air raids, not guerrillas, but it's all part of the same thing. Play the game and pay the price. The people of northern Israel simply dig in. It's not a good way to live, but they know no other. Kfar Giladi builds a complex of 50 underground bunkers to survive the rocket attacks of the PLO. Attacks by people who also believe they own this land. Everything is very normal and very usual until we have the Katyushas and the bombings and the shells and we need to hide in the shelters and then for some days or some period our normal life uh, is really destroyed. We have only to hide our heads and to lie very quietly to hear if it's uh, coming through, if it's falling far. In fact, these bunkers haven't been used much recently. For the past 11 months, there's been an effective ceasefire between Israel and the PLO. But the whole northern border area is tense. For years, the Israeli government has been longing to destroy the PLO in southern Lebanon. It's common knowledge that the plans to invade Lebanon are ready, just waiting for the right excuse. On Thursday, June 3rd, 1982, Israel's ambassador in London is gunned down in front of the Dorchester Hotel. The gunman is Palestinian, and the following day, Israel seizes the pretext and launches massive air raids on Palestinian camps around Beirut. The PLO retaliates with fierce rocket attacks against the northern settlements, including Far Giladi. Finally, Prime Minister Begin and his Defense Minister Ariel Sharon have the excuse they need to invade Lebanon. The cabinet took the following decision to instruct the Israel Defense Forces to place all civilian population of the Galilee beyond the range of the terrorists' fire from Lebanon, where they, their bases and their headquarters are concentrated. A military spokesman said later that the Israelis were on search and destroy missions against Palestinians who had fired rockets into Israel. In fact, the operation which the Israelis describe as search and destroy, which is to penetrate only 40 kilometers into Lebanon, is not that at all. It's a full-scale invasion that isn't going to stop anywhere short of Beirut. Shortly after noon, bombs and artillery fell throughout southern Lebanon. Cover fire for the invasion launched against the Palestinian guerrillas. Civilians have been packing for days and now crowd the coastal roads fleeing to safer areas. Israeli planes pounded several areas. And the anti-aircraft fire was intense. Palestinian guerrillas brought supplies and reinforcements south before the highways were cut. Israel's reserves are called up, and on Sunday, June 6th at 11 a.m., a whole army, around 30,000 men and over 1,000 tanks and heavy guns, plunges into Lebanon to stamp out the PLO. It's round seven of the Arab-Israeli wars. Fargiladi learns of its first casualty in the new war. Yossi Keller, a young helicopter pilot from the kibbutz, is shot down and taken as a prisoner to Beirut, where Palestinians, mad with rage and fear, beat him to death in the streets. If he was lucky, he was dead by the time these pictures were taken. 
Yossi is Oyesh Kohli's brother-in-law. The pilot's father sees the pictures on television, and Ori's father tries to console him. He said to me, so it happens to my son also, nothing to do. I'll be more silent if the body will be here in the cemetery. Now I'm, 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 I don't know where I am. Where, where is the body of my son? That's what he say. And I have no words to, to, to make him a, a better feeling. What can you say in such a case? Israeli tanks met only moderate opposition as they swept further into southern Lebanon today. Palestinian gunners fired sporadically but were quickly overwhelmed by the Israeli armor. Some PLO soldiers surrendered and others were killed. There's no word from either side on the numbers of casualties. On the fourth day of the war, Nimrod Holvitz changes from kibbutznik to army captain as he prepares to leave Kfar Giladi again for Lebanon. He's already been in once, but like most Israeli men, he's in the military reserves, and the army has to let the reservists get home to their jobs whenever possible. Otherwise, the entire economy would grind to a halt. Nimrod was called again late last night, and by noon, he'll be in Lebanon fighting. Is it hard to leave your wife? Look, not the wife, the kids. That's the problem, but that's the life here. Do the kids know where you're going? Yeah, sure. Sure. They know. Nimrod Horvitz's unit has the dangerous job of hunting down the PLO guerrillas left behind in southern Lebanon when the main Israeli force pushed through. It's Nimrod's third war and he hates it. But like most Israelis, he sees it as us or them. Look, fight, it's fight. Bullet, it's bullet. It's not a picnic. And it's, uh, if it's uh, 400 uh, Katyushas or uh, two Katyushas, it's the same. It's the unknown, frightened a little bit, but uh, that's it. And I was very happy, you know, like, uh, because I, I was living in the Upper Galilee. And I live in a kibbutz that get a lot of bombs inside. And uh, my kids, a lot of times, going inside the shelters. And now they was outside. They're not sitting in the ground. Somebody else sitting in the ground. But it's neither Israeli troops nor PLO guerrillas who are suffering the most in this war. It's the Lebanese civilians trapped in the fighting and dying under Israeli bombs and shells. I've seen planes attacking, bombing areas where there were civilians. There are thousands killed. Where is the Sixth Fleet? Where is the relief? Please, if you can get this message to my country, please do it. The Sorry. Israelis have virtually destroyed parts of this city of 200,000 because they say several thousand of the people here were members of the PLO. In many ways, the real victims of this conflict are the refugees who sleep tonight in makeshift tents on the shores of the Mediterranean. People whose homes and businesses were destroyed by war. The Palestinian refugees can never get what they want through war. The Israelis are too well armed and too ruthless. Maybe the Palestinians cannot get much of what they believe are their rights by peaceful means either. But it's never really been tried. Instead, both peoples go on depending on military violence as the ultimate means of getting their own way. And so do we all. Like most Israelis in time of war, Uri Eshkoli spends his evenings in front of the TV set. First, the results of the day's fighting are given. Israel now surrounds Beirut and, the Israelis are told, it's only a matter of time before PLO resistance caves in. But what follows is more sobering. A list of the names of the soldiers buried that day. 
There have been 250 so far in the first two weeks of fighting. I know one of them. Tzvi Gafni, I know Tzvi Gafni. I know it. We are Kablan, I know it. One of them, I know he was a contractor. He used to buy a concrete from our quarry. I used to argue with him on, on, the, on the price, and he, he didn't like to, to pay it at the time, so we used to argue. I think it's him, Tzvi Gafni, the age is also the same age, so he say it's supposed to be him. I just talked with someone on, who knows him yesterday, and look, look. just talking. Kadima. As Israeli troops die in Lebanon, 18-year-olds are being fed into the other end of the military machine. These young Israeli paratroops are nearing the end of their training in a camp in the occupied West Bank. Then they'll be sent straight to Lebanon, even before making their first parachute jump. And, and we talked just with one of our, one, with one of our uh, sergeants who went up to Lebanon, and he talked and he spoke and he told us exactly what it was like, what it's like to go in there and how, how it is to feel and I have to train here and how you have to be... I serious. And how much you have to be serious here or else you won't be able to be good there and I, exactly what it's like to be face to face with Syrians and with tanks and things blowing up and terrorists popping out of bushes here and there and, and they lay it all on the line. In Lebanon the fighting continues around Beirut broken by ceasefires, which are in turn broken within days or even hours. Meanwhile, on the Golan Heights, facing the bulk of the Syrian army, there's only a tense calm. The Israelis watch the Syrians, who, of course, watch the Israelis. Muhammad! And here, where the two enemies are only a hundred yards apart, a sort of fellowship develops between the opposing soldiers who may someday soon have to fight each other. What's he saying to him? Uh, speak to me, speak to me. Come here and speak to me. Do they ever speak to you? Yes, sometimes they speak. What do they say? Uh, hello, and uh, our food is better than yours, and uh, something like this, but not, not politician, not nothing. It's not uncommon, this sympathy between soldiers on opposite sides. Captain Pini Avigur remembers another time when Arabs and Israelis were brought closer together by war. Uh, when we were uh, close to them, in the, near the border, in Sinai, sometimes, many times, we make, we have uh, conditions that we, we was talking with them, changing cigarettes, talking about homes, about families. As uh, friends, no, uh, there was no, no, uh, no difference between the uh, Egyptian uh, soldiers and the Israel soldiers. We talk about everything in the world, even about war. And then you have to fight them. And when we have, we, we fight them. Neither the Palestinians, nor even the Arab world, cannot in the foreseeable future even dream about eliminating or even causing a real danger to the Israeli cause using the military system. It's quite time for them, I think for us too, to understand that the Arabs have no chance in the foreseeable future 
using the military system. And of course the Israelis have no chance, because whatever one may say, and even if the Israeli military system is the best in the Middle East, this Israeli military system cannot conquer the whole of the Middle East and cannot enforce the Arab world politically to do whatever we like. So in the military sphere, the Arab-Israeli conflict is stalemated. You, you can just spill more blood and conquer some more square kilometers and kill more people and destroy more tanks or missiles or, uh, um, or airplanes. But politically, I think you cannot basically achieve anything. It's true, of course, but it cannot work until the leaders and the peoples accept that war provides no permanent solution to their problems and accept the painful compromises that would be necessary instead of war. Meanwhile, the world unfailingly produces a new crop of 18-year-olds each year, and these young paratroops training for this war and the next and the next have their final exercise, a mock attack over ground which closely matches the terrain of Lebanon. The idea of getting into a war is obviously very attractive to these young recruits. Make the training as realistic as possible, use live ammunition, even make them carry out their own casualties and still they can't wait. Of course, the idea of being dead at 18 has no appeal, but it's very hard for 18-year-olds to believe in their own death. Quite soon now, though, the army is very likely to put them into situations where they have to believe in it. And then there's another notion to help carry them through, the idea of sacrifice. Asking our young men to lay down their lives for the good of all of us, of the whole nation, is part of the way we've always done things. And so long as they have faith in their leader's judgment, by and large, the young men are willing to make that sacrifice. You know, those ancient kings, David, Solomon, they always fought. And uh, it's a repetition of the same story of a very stubborn small nation trying to live among this uh, other nations around here. And uh, whenever someone goes to sleep, whenever someone rests for a while and put off his arms, he is exposed to someone who jumps on his neck. And uh, I certainly believe that the generation that is growing now, my son, I have a five years old son, you know, will have to fight. And maybe my grandchild will have to fight. And uh, maybe that's the way it should be. But there is another idea abroad in the world today that the whole community should make lesser sacrifices so that nobody has to die. About 5,000 anti-war demonstrators gathered in Tel Aviv this afternoon. The protest, one of the largest peace rallies in Israel's history, was organized by the Committee Against Invasion. It wants an immediate Israeli withdrawal from Lebanon. None of these people know exactly what concessions they would have to make for peace, but the sacrifices would certainly be very painful. They would have to give up land that many Israelis believe they have a right to, and they would have to let the Arabs control places from which they could threaten Israeli towns and cities. But Israel faces the same choice as everybody else. Make the sacrifices and take the risks necessary for peace, or go on killing other people's children and burying your own. It's now the fourth week in a war that was supposed to last just four days. Pini Avigua is back on his farm in the Golan Heights, in occupied Syria, in other words. He will have two days away from his unit to catch up on his work before he has to return to the army. Like most reservists, Pini's army unit is located very close to his home. When he's mobilized, he just gets in his jeep and he's at his war in half an hour. And in a way, his family is mobilized too. This time I was really worried. It was a heavy big farm and you know, to be alone, it's very hard. You can see if something happens in Israel, everyone is running every hour to the radio to hear some news or if you hear in the middle of the day, more than every hour, everyone is running to the radio. 
That afternoon, during a party at his children's school, Peeney learns that the army is calling him back early, and his private life disappears again. He'll be in uniform and back with his unit before the sun sets. hesitate to fire back, and today they did just that. According to an Israeli army spokesman, the PLO soldiers in Beirut suburbs had fired first. In the buildings between Israelis and Palestinians, Lebanon's Christian militiamen kept up the pressure, pouring fire into the Palestinian strongholds with little regard for the ceasefire. Gabi Bashan has just come back from Beirut, and it's the last time he'll have to fight. A week ago, his unit was sitting on the edge of the city, waiting for the diplomats and the generals to decide the fate of Beirut. He was drinking coffee late one night. It was dark and very quiet when a Palestinian guerrilla threw a grenade into his camp. One man died, and Gabi lost the bottom half of both his legs. <laughs> Every third or fourth family here in Israel uh, have someone that uh, dead or wounded hard in the walls. You wait from this, from the moment that uh, you are 18, you know that it might happen. You live, and I'm now 35, that's 17 years, but I know someday it will happen. I will be very lucky if, if not. This young Lebanese boy's luck ran out at about the same time as Gabby's. He's just been brought in from Beirut with his foot blown off. The Israelis, like the PLO, claim that Lebanese civilians are not targets, and no doubt they're not. But they're being killed and maimed anyway, by the thousands. Uh, look, uh... I don't like to kill people. And I kill Arabs. Maybe I'll tell you a story. A car came against us in the middle of the war, without white flag. And uh, five minutes before came another car, and uh, there were four Palestinians with RPG there, killed three of my friends. So we saw uh, a new Peugeot come against us. And we shoot. And then we saw a family there. Three children. And uh, I cried. But uh, I couldn't take the chance. It's a real problem. Uh, when we shoot, we didn't know what is there. Were the children killed in the car? Children, father and mother. All the family was killed, yes. But uh, we couldn't take the chance. Even with the fighting still going on in Lebanon, they're holding maneuvers in Israel as usual. Pini's unit of reservists is now engaged in an enormous exercise on the Golan Heights. That's what he was dragged away from home for. Even this exercise costs a small fortune, and the war in Lebanon has already cost over a billion dollars. But the Israelis are willing to keep on spending the money. It's still less than the cost of losing a war. They only have to look at the Palestinians to know what that cost would be. But the constant cycle of war and training for war wears people out, and it also brutalizes them, even the best of them. When you inside the fire, when the fire starts, forget all your fairness. You start work like you are in a training. Even it is, I'm sorry to say it, but even the people you see and you're shooting looks to you as a target in a training. While shooting, you, you are not thinking this is a human being. After it, you start to think. But while shooting, it is the pure target. Peeney, the night after a battle, do you think about it? Do you think about the people who were killed in the battle? 
the night after the battle, I slept all over the night. But uh, after it, I thought a lot. Some long days and nights. And uh, yes, I thought about the people I killed. And some of them very close to me. Uh, I thought about my friends that were killed. <clears throat> very close friends. And that's it. After it, after some years came a new war. And another, the same will started again. The same feelings about the killed enemy, about the good friends. It's perfectly natural that some men, like Peeney, eventually feel exhausted by the price they pay for their nation's sovereignty, especially when payment's made the way it is in Israel. You don't just do your military service once and for all when you're young. Year after year, the army demands at least a month of your time and energy, and of course, if another war comes along, it may still demand your life as well. Your military obligation lasts until you're 54 years old, and by that time, on average, an Israeli man will have spent at least seven years in uniform and fought in four or five wars, even without being in the regular army. Most people still feel that the price of nationhood is worth paying, but as they get older, they find it's much harder to keep the payments up. Also, for some people, the doubt starts to creep in. Is all this effort and sacrifice really leading anywhere, except to more of the same? It's now the end of the first month of fighting in Lebanon. It's also the end of the period of mourning for a young tank commander from Kfar Giladi who was killed on the first day of the fighting. The body of the second young man killed from Kfar Giladi, the helicopter pilot who was beaten to death in Beirut, has still not been returned. It probably never will be. graduating class of paratroops is now having its final day of training, a 30-kilometer march from the Paris base into Jerusalem. It starts at 5 in the morning at a dead run. By evening, the march has become a walk as the Paris approach their final destination, the heart of the old city of Jerusalem, 
captured by Israel in an earlier war. The ceremony in which they're finally granted the right to wear the paratroops' red beret is the kind every nation uses to persuade its young men how noble it is to kill and die in behalf of the rest of us. Only the emotional symbols are specifically Israeli. The ceremony is held at night, in front of the Wailing Wall, lit only by the flaming emblem of the Israeli paratroops. The band plays and each young soldier comes forward in turn. They're given a Bible, a rifle and a wish of good luck. Soon they'll be in Lebanon, where no doubt all three will come in very handy. The PLO has its own rituals and symbols to keep its young men fighting. But the Palestinians still don't have a state and their military forces have been smashed, so the PLO is on the move again. At the end of August 1982, it's forced to evacuate Beirut. Another generation of Palestinians faces a future of war too. How old are you? Uh, uh, 11 years old. 11 years old. And wh why are you fighting? Because I want to go to Palestine. You want to go? And where are you living now? Living uh, in Beirut. Living in Beirut. And where are you leaving to? Where are you going to I'm now? going to uh, yeah, uh, Yemen. The trucks crept slowly from the assembly point onto the road. The noise from this demonstration of Palestinian defiance was a little too much for some as the PLO evacuation of Beirut gathered momentum. The illusion of a final military victory lives on on both sides. Journalists and Lebanese were surprised when Israeli Defense Minister Ariel Sharon dropped into the Hotel Alexander in East Beirut for lunch. We came here only for one purpose. Well, I do understand and this, that but is I to destroy, to destroy. I take it, take this world to destroy the terrorist PLO Palestinian organizations. About the same time as Beirut is being evacuated, Gabi Bashan takes his first tentative steps. It's been a month since Gabby was first wounded, and about one month from now, he'll walk out of the hospital on his new legs. Israel, for unhappy reasons, has just about the best occupational therapy specialists in the world. A month ago, over Lebanon, this Israeli fighter shot down its first Syrian MiG. That's what the roundel there means. Israel's come a very long way since 1948, when its first few war surplus fighters were flown in here in pieces. Now it's the strongest military power in the Middle East by far. Israelis still pay a price for their statehood in money, in effort, and from time to time in lives. But every country does that. Israelis pay a much higher price than luckier countries in safer parts of the world, but Israelis still reckon it's a price well worth paying. What they get in return, after all, is genuine security. It's quite inconceivable that Israel could now be overrun by its neighbors, that they could even begin to match the awesome combination of military organization and weapons and combat skills built up in this country over the past four decades. But in the end, all this military power cannot win them peace, however many wars it wins. It's not just Israel's problem, of course. Every country is the same. If you prepare for war, sooner or later you will get it. 
And in the meanwhile, the attitudes that you have to nourish to be able to fight wars will spread and flourish in your society. The mood, the, I would say cultural mood of the average Israeli is that the most important symptom or symbol of independence is military power. And there is a danger that out of objective um, situation, our existing culture is being too much affiliated and influenced by the very existence of brutal military force. It was the women who brought out the first rumors of massacre. Christian militiamen, it was never precisely clear which group, had, they said, come into the camp and murdered some of the men and taken the rest to a sports stadium nearby. In the camp itself, the first sign of murder, two old men lying in the main road. But down the side streets, the evidence was even worse. This was the first massacre we found, 18 bodies in all. Further on, another... As people, the Israelis are no worse than anybody else, nor any better. The Israeli state and army actually do behave better than many others. A formal inquiry was held into who in the government and the army had allowed Israel's Christian Lebanese allies to enter the Palestinian camps, and those responsible were slapped smartly on the wrist. It's the same everywhere. Nobody can win wars without being ruthless, and war brutalizes even those who try hardest to stay decent. You become resigned to the necessity of killing people, and it hardly matters to the dead whether they were massacred by Lebanese militiamen, or shot by mistake by an Israeli soldier, or bombed in their homes by pilots who obey all the rules of war, or for that matter killed as soldiers in battle. If you believe that there is no solution to your problems except war, people are going to die. Israelis would obviously prefer not to have built their state on a foundation of successful wars, but they never had a choice in the matter. Nobody does. There's hardly any country in the world that didn't start with wars of conquest or unification or independence. Only thing different about Israel is that it was founded relatively recently and the foundation wars are still going on. If you don't have a state, you're helpless and terribly vulnerable, as the Jews always knew and the Palestinians have now learned. So we've all organized our world into sovereign states possessing great power. We have no means of enforcing peaceful compromise between states or even of deciding what the compromises should be. So we settle our really serious disputes by force, by war. The Israelis have simply accepted this system which governs the entire world and made it work for them. It's worked very well. They win their wars, so far at a relatively low cost in lives. More Israelis are killed in car crashes than in war. And they get more of what they want than most states do. More territory, more security, more power. In Israel, the union between army and state, the fact that the country is founded on military force, is both obvious and to most Israelis acceptable. Elsewhere, the fact that we too depend ultimately on armed force to assert our right to exist as independent states is often less obvious. But when we do notice it, we mostly accept it too. We should not accept it, because that is to consent to war everlasting.